Well, hello, hello, guys. Welcome to the Elsa Kurt Show. I'm your host, Elsa Kurt, and today I have a really special guest on. His name is Kasim Hafiz, and we're going to be talking about this incredible documentary. It is called Never Again, and it's very, very special. And I'm looking forward to talking to Kasim right after this. One day I'm carrying my friend's books and she looks at me and she says, I don't want you to carry my books. In fact, I don't want to talk to you anymore. I say, why? Because you're a Jew. And my father told me, A, not to be friendly with a Jew. Socially, it's unacceptable. And B, you're evil. In fact, you as a Jew are responsible for every single thing that goes wrong in the world. Thus begins the transformation of society on an individual basis. Things have changed. I'm no longer the same person as I was before. I haven't changed, but the world is changing around me. And thus begins the slippery slope of persecution of Jews, in particular the persecution of Irving Roth. All right, that's uh, some powerful stuff right there. And with us, we have Kasim Hasif Hafiz. I'm so sorry. I told you I was going to do that. And uh, we're going to be talking about your part in this incredible, powerful film. Thank you so much for joining me. No, thank you for having me on. It's great to be here. Awesome. Um, so now you have the other side of this story. That was, of course, Irving Roth, who throughout the documentary talks about uh, his experience. Um, let's talk about all of this from your perspective. Give us a little bit of your background, your upbringing, and, uh, and how this became such a powerful time in life for you. For sure. So I grew up in England um, in a place called Nottingham, which is famous for Robin Hood, uh, who was a thief. Uh, he'd have a great career in politics nowadays. But anyway, um, so I grew <laughs> up in Nottingham and my family had come to England from Pakistan as economic migrants. I had a very conventional upbringing in many ways. Uh, also lived in a predominantly Muslim Pakistani neighborhood my community. And look, I wouldn't say that my family were radical or extreme, especially compared to the radical and extremism you see in the Muslim community today in certain parts. But there was this visceral hatred of Jews, Israel, and essentially all things the West, uh, primarily America. So that's kind of what I grew up with. And as I grew older and extremism really started to take root in the community that I grew up in. And it was reflective of a lot of communities in the UK at the time. And there's a number of reasons for that, uh, which I can go into if you'd like. Um, yeah. But I got to a point where I saw violence and being anti-Western and anti-Semitic as almost a calling. And, and this is I've lived in the United States for a number of years now. I lived in Canada before that. And the United, so let's be very direct. So there is an obsession in the United States with talking about race. There really is. Mm. It's bizarre to me. And, I agree. And it's really interesting for me because, you know, I'm, I'm brown, if you hadn't noticed, <laughs> um, <laughs> where... When that conversation comes up, and I will always say, and I stand by this because of my personal experiences, I am so grateful that my children will be born in America and not in Europe. Because, look, every country, no matter where it is, will have people who are racist or who are bigots or whatever. That is just part and part of the world. You have good people and bad people. But in Europe, there is this perception which is held by way too many people 
And it's almost ingrained that to be British or to be French or to be German, you have to be white. That is something mm -hmm. that does not exist in America. I, I, it's, so my wife is American and she is always amused by how patriotic I am because this mm -hmm. feels like home to me. I spent 30 years in England. America feels like home because not for a single second have I felt like I didn't belong ever. And in Europe, the issue is you had people of a Pakistani heritage, but who were British born there who did not feel part of the country that they called home. Mm. That then opened the door for some for extremist groups or whoever it is. When you feel isolated from your home, you feel like you don't belong, you, it, it creates this cycle. And what these groups did is create a victim narrative that, okay, mm. because you're Muslim, you are a victim of Western society. And again, when you break that down, what does that even mean? How, how can you be a victim of a society? It, it doesn't make sense. But it, it traps you because now you're, you have somebody to be angry at, but you're not really a victim. So you can't address that victimhood. So you're just in this circle of self-pity, anger and hatred, which makes you open to embracing some really idiotic and extreme ideas. Sure. So, uh, yeah. I mean, any, any extremist group will prey on anyone who's vulnerable and weak and, you know, almost dependent on what right. they're being told. So that makes perfect sense. So, so that's the path I went down. And mm -hmm. I, at one stage in my life, I got to the point where I was ready to join a terrorist organization because I felt that was the only way to do something positive. So yeah, that's really incredible. And, and it's actually so understandable hearing it from your perspective. It makes so much sense because how else would you know otherwise, really? This is, you know, this is what you're brought up to believe. It's what you're told from a young age. And, and I, I find the, the juxtaposition of it really fascinating because, um, and I'm going to make an assumption here. I'm going to assume, you can correct me, of course, that you were raised in a, in a loving home uh, where, you know, your family loved each other and cared for each other but there was this us and them mentality within the culture that you were being taught correct right it was this adversarial mm. almost yeah i mean you, you yeah. spot on this us versus them and mm -hmm. you know it's it creates such a dangerous mix and it's it, it opens people up to a level of manipulation and extremism which is incredibly dangerous because you hear for example you know my father would say that hitler was a great man his one mistake was he didn't murder enough jews if you mm. hear that every week from the time you're four till you're 15 that is now a reality it's not an opinion it's not bigotry it is just a reality yeah i understand that i really do um so what's so fascinating to me is that this is what you were immersed in from from birth your entire young existence was with that perspective and that set of beliefs uh tell me about when that started to shift from you for you i should say sure so i was at my most radical i was at college which it's so interesting i was at a british university and instead of that being this place where I'm exposed to new ideas and all these things, it kind of, it hastened my extremes. Um, but sadly, that's kind of a reflection of academia all over the Western world at the moment. Um, but I came across this book called The Case for Israel by Alan Dershowitz. And I bought this book with this arrogance that I know the truth and I would just be able to kind of rattle through their arguments and show how they're wrong. But what it actually did was it exposed me to a different one because I'd been in an echo chamber of what I'd grown up with and my friends now believed that. So I just kind of continued down that path. And that then put me in this situation where I still disagree. Like I can't accept that I'm wrong, but some of these things I've never even heard that Israel is a democracy, that, you know, the Jewish people have had roots in the Holy Land for thousands of years, basically challenging all of these beliefs that I believe to be true. And also I was a college student, so I knew anything, ever, everything anyway. Um, and that kind of took me down this path of trying to prove this book wrong. 
again, when you believe something to the point when you are essentially celebrating the death of women and children and you are ready to kill people yourself, you don't read one book and go, okay, I got it wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that kind of, I get put a crack in the wall of my ignorance. And then that would lead to me going to Israel. Again, not mm -hmm. in this quest for truth, but to to validate and verify my own bigotry. And it was mm -hmm. actually being there in Israel, which changed everything. It was the reality of it, seeing it with my own eyes, experiencing it, which made me realize how wrong I had got it and how I now had an obligation to right the wrong of what I had believed and what I had preached. Wow. Uh, it's so amazing to me and so admirable that you did that. And and I really love that you what you started this quest and this um, experience with uh, a mindset, like you said, of, of basically disproving everything that they said because you had the argument against it. And then to have your heart change that way and, and see this completely different perspective from what you only known your whole life, I, I think is so, so powerful and impactful for others to see. And um, I would love to hear some more about how that has affected you in your relations with your family and friends from home too, because not, now you're bringing thoughts and ideas that are completely opposite to what they've all agreed with. And not necessarily everyone is open to something so radically different than what they believed. Um, how did that go over for you? Not well, <laughs> not well at all. I, <laughs> Silly question, me, really. <laughs> no, no, no. For me, there was this genuine naivety that I thought, look, I'm gonna go back to England and go, hey, I've just come back from the Middle East. This is what I saw. And people like, I didn't, again, maybe naive, but I didn't think it would be an issue. Um, but it became a huge issue. And over time, the more I spoke out, you know, I, I'm not really in touch with my family. I, the, the community that I was part of my whole life, I was now not only an outsider, but somebody who was seen as hostile and treated as such. You know, I would get death threats and people would come up to me at the supermarket and, and you know, make threats. So, I made the decision eventually, uh, years later. So I went to Israel in 2007. In 2014, I decided to move to Canada. I was like, I just, I don't want to live my life looking over my shoulder constantly. Um, and, you know, even a week ago, I got, you know, I get death threats on social media and, you know, I get this long death threat. So I sent it back to him, spell checked. I went, you made some grammatical <laughs> errors. Um, they go off, they go, they go down too well. Um, but yeah, look, it's, it's unfortunately, there is such a one, this mindset that people aren't willing to hear a different perspective. And again, I, if you want to hear my perspective or I will listen to someone else and we can disagree, that is okay. That is mm -hmm. okay. But to see that one in my family and friend circle, part of me. And it's only been in the last few years where, while I, I know it's wrong, I can understand it. And when I say that, because that's all they know, and they're yeah. not willing to step outside of that. What has been really disturbing and really bothered me is the response I get when I speak on US campuses. Mm -hmm. This, you know, again, a place where we're meant to be able to have the open exchange of ideas with, where we can disagree. And it's trying to shut people down it's trying to silence people and, and what happens today and and this is again i have to just laugh because uh, what else do you do when me yeah. looking the way i do goes <laughs> onto a campus in the united states to talk about israel and anti-semitism and i have the whitest students telling me i'm racist i'm just like <laughs> this is like this is like something from a monty python sketch it's ridiculous yeah, it's hard to believe that this is real life, isn't it? Like, this is real life. How can this be happening in America, of all places? How could this be happening? I, I couldn't possibly agree with you more. The insanity of it is just mind blowing. And, and you're so right. It is such a pervasive issue um, in this country right now and for quite some time. And it is, um, 
it's just shocking. I don't, I feel like we shouldn't be shocked anymore, but it still shocks me every day that right. this is where we're at. And I, I'm so thankful for people like you that are, are defying the, their, their insanity and, and speaking <sighs> truth and um, courageously too, because you are literally getting death threats. So to be doing what you're doing is, is so brave. Uh, thank you for doing that. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. It's, it's, it's really cliche, but it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, without being very, I absolutely love this country. Like I fell in love with this country very quickly and we're very fortunate to be here. And I think so many people born in the United States don't realize how fortunate they are because, you know, this is all they've known. And they've been, it's like being given a gift this amazing gift, but you didn't have to earn it. You didn't have to fight for it. So you take it for granted and you think that everywhere else is better. And I'm just like, you live in a bubble, which isn't reality. Please mm -hmm. go, go to Europe, go, you know, if you think racism doesn't exist anywhere or it's so bad in the United States, please go spend some time in Europe and, and tell me, tell me how that goes. Yeah, exactly. Kasim, you put that all like so perfectly in a nutshell. You summed it up so accurately what is happening now. You're, we're dealing with, uh, you know, a generation and a society that has no concept of what it means to, to suffer and to truly struggle and, um, and to have the types of, um, governing r rule that prevents you from speaking and from having opinions and sharing those opinions without fear. And uh, I agree. I would like to just put them all on a plane and uh, give them an alternate experience. <laughs> right. Uh, and I use Europe as an example. And Europe is still the Western world. There's a lot worse. But like, I mean, yeah, it's people don't realize Absolutely. how fortunate they are at all they really don't it's they don't it's sad you're so right oh you're so so right now tell me let's talk a little bit about the film because I, i've seen portions of it now and 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 every time i get goosebumps because it's it's so powerful it's so moving to see these perspectives um and, and see this all come together the way it did how did this documentary even come about so I work for an organization called Christians United for Israel and Irving, who sadly passed away last year, has been working with us for a long time and telling his story and, and sharing and educating people about the Holocaust and the dangers of anti-Semitism, where hatred and bigotry can lead. And like many Holocaust survivors, he was, you know, in his 80s, almost 90. So we wanted to make sure that he told for generations to come because it was so important. And we then saw that anti had reached new heights, I mean, all over the world, but even in the United States, it's at the highest rate it's ever been. So we, this concept started to form and me and Irving have had a friendship for a number of years. And we felt that there was an opportunity here where we can tell Irving's story, but sadly, people look at the Holocaust as something as distant history that it couldn't possibly happen again. I mean, we see it with 9-11, it was only 20 years ago and people think it was, people have forgotten. So we saw the opportunity where here's me, who was born in Britain in the Western world, British citizen, and I grew up with the same hatred, was saying the same things. I, I just had, you know, for, for everybody, it was just fortunate that I wasn't in a position of power. I was just one person or a group of people. But that same rhetoric, the same ultimate agenda exists today. And as Irving always would say, the Holocaust didn't just happen. There were signposts on the way to Auschwitz. And we want to kind of ring the alarm bell of, hello, like, are you paying attention? Because there is this, uh, sadly, even the fight against anti-Semitism has become, for some, politicized. They will condemn mm -hmm. some anti-Semitism, but not other anti-Semitism. And it's a problem. So we kind of wanted to shine a light and essentially go, look, here is everything. Here is the complete picture. Now make a choice. Either you're going to speak up or you're going to speak up selectively or not speak up at all. Yeah, that makes uh, a lot of sense to me. And I, you know, my, my wish for something like this, um, 
is that it's mandatory viewing for for especially for our college kids and and even younger really um the more knowledge that you have which is really being denied our students right now you know they're they're being taught uh just one narrative and they're not being taught to think they're not being taught to reason and to um you know research and explore and and understand anything more than their own personal feelings and opinions so um something like this is so powerful and um how how have you guys been getting your word out about the film just uh, the all the traditional routes have you gotten a good reception to this so, so yeah, we've uh, it was in theaters for a limited run uh, about a year ago, middle of COVID. <laughs> um, mm. But then we it came to streaming on June seventh, and we've been using the traditional social media, the Kufi kind of membership network. A lot of churches are screening it also, and we're having discussions about it. So, and and our organization has a campus branch too, so we've been streaming it on some campuses. Um, so we're trying to get it out as wide as possible and at the very least spark some conversation and debate. I mean, it's, again, we're almost become like a post-debate society, which is scary. Um, mm-hmm. so, so that's really been kind of the main, main thrust of getting the film out there. That's fantastic. Now, um, tell, tell everyone where they can find the, the film, of course, and how they can find you as well. Sure. So the film if you is want them on... to. <laughs> I mean, if Maybe you send don't me want a, a you. message, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah we'll, we'll, somewhere in between. Um, yeah. So the website for the film is neveragainthemovie.com. Uh, it's available on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, and some other formats, which I can't remember. Um, but it'll have it on the website. And it comes out on DVD on the 22nd of June. And if you want to contact me, uh, cufi.org, Christians United for Israel, there is a link you can reach out to me. And I am on social media, but I have no idea what my handles are because I hardly ever use social media. But yeah. Good for you. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'm sure you're much happier than, than the rest of us that are super immersed in it. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I used to do some social media uh, marketing for a while. And I was like, I do not want to do this anymore. So. Yeah, it's it's mind numbing a little bit to to say the least, I think. Kasim, yeah. tell me, what's the one thing that you want people to take away from this film? What would you want the the overall message for them to walk away with? So I guess it would be the power of the individual. I know that may sound like a strange uh, thing given the context of the film and and the topic, but I want people to realize how much of a difference they can make as individuals. How much of a difference they, because when we look at anything like anti-Semitism or or whatever the issue is, it seems overwhelming. You look at the statistics, you look at the reports, how can I make a difference? You can, be it talking to friends, family, be it, educating be whatever it is you can make a difference Uh, and it goes beyond just the case of anti-semitism ultimately when i look at it we have a responsibility as americans nobody else is going to do anything for us unless we do something and we are blessed we really are with a political system where we can directly petition those who we put in power they work for us like so i want people to feel empowered that they can do things to make their cities, their communities, their family, and this country the best it can possibly be. Because it's the very least we can do for everyone who has fought and sacrificed for us to live in a country which is free. And you know, to quote Ronald Reagan, freedom is never more than one generation away. And I, I do at times feel like we're falling asleep at the wheel. So I just want people to feel empowered and take away that they have to be the change. It can't be optional. If you if you really care about something, if you really love something, you would do everything to ensure that it is cared for and the best it can be. And it's it's time to for our actions to speak louder than words. I agree with you completely. And and you're so right. You know, I, I think so often people think that they get complacent and they think that, well, somebody else will do it. They see the right. problem. 
they agree that there's a problem, but um, you know, they've got laundry to do and work to get to and all that. So somebody else will take care of it. And um, you know, we're so far past that that point where it really you're so right. It really does take everyone as individuals to make that difference in their little part of the world. You know, we think, you know, we're just one person and we can't make a difference. And it could you, we couldn't be more wrong to think that way. So I, I think that's a really great message to put out and for people to hear and incorporate in their lives because you you do you have to participate and you have to educate yourself and um and i really liked what you said about this being a post-debate society and i think you're so right that uh, we need to bring back the power and the ability to discuss things with people we disagree with and uh and i think this film is is such a great step in doing that so I, I thank you tremendously for, for being part of this and, and uh, sharing as much as you have uh, about your personal experiences. It's, it's been such a joy to be able to meet you and to hear everything that you have to say. So thank you so, so much. No, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been really awesome. Wonderful, wonderful. And I know you're on you're on the circuit. You've got lots more of these to do. And uh, I wish you all the best with with everything and great success and your safety, too, as well. <laughs> okay, Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> all right, guys, this has been the Elsa Kurt show. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you in the next episode. Take care.